Our lives have been uh, dominated, as we all know, by the coronavirus. Um, but this week is what Christians have, uh, down through history, called Holy Week. Um, and it's the time when we look towards the central events of human history. It's very easy to think that, you know, coronavirus is one of the biggest things to kind of hit our planet, certainly in recent history. But actually it pales into insignificance next to the events which are actually the turning point of history. Uh, the greatest points in history, those things that happened uh, in the Easter week, um, uh, just under... Um, 2,000 years ago um, and we're at, we are if you like on, on holy ground as we look at the cross because it is the heart of God's plan and the pinnacle of Jesus's uh, life and work mm. and at the centre of what we believe um, but we're also on historical ground. Luke in his gospel and Peter in his second letter both speak of writing from eyewitness accounts so at the heart of our faith it is solid historical fact the cross had a time and a real date uh, and my favorite date actually for um favored date amongst uh, some likely ones um is friday the 3rd of april ad 33 and the cross had not only a real time but an actual location and that's kind of what we're going to look at today as we do a work walk through first century jerusalem um, and Jesus, as he um, approaches Jerusalem, he's been actually on this, on this journey for quite a while. As soon as he tells his disciples for the first time that he is going to die, as Luke uh, 9 tells us, Jesus resolutely sets out for Jerusalem. This is the place where God's plans will come to their climax and be fulfilled. And today we're going to take, if you like, a, a walk around first century Jerusalem using some uh, maps, some models, some paintings and some uh, computer generated images to give us a feel for this city, to help us to see that it's real, to visualise the events uh, and to visualise the people and to explain some of the significance of the events that happened in that first Easter. Um, and um, one of the first things that we notice actually is um, what, says, uh, what it says in Luke 18, Jesus says to the disciples, we are going up to Jerusalem. Um, because actually when Jesus says that, He's not talking as we might talk about going up north. He was talking about a literal up because Jerusalem was at a, on a higher um, elevation than most of the um, countryside around it. It wasn't the highest point in Israel, but it was higher than um, any of the surrounding countryside. So actually people went, well, literally went up to Jerusalem. Um, it's two and a half thousand feet above sea level. Jer Jericho, on the other hand, is 1200 feet below sea level. So you may remember in the story of the uh, Good Samaritan, Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And again, that was um, a literal down. But anyway, we're going to get a, a bit of a feel for the layout of Jerusalem here. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention um, some places, but we're going to come back to all of these in more detail. But this is to, just to give you um, a bit of a feel for the actual geography, uh, the overall geography of the city. So over on the right hand side, um, number one, that we have the Mount of Olives, which Jesus comes down as we were thinking yesterday, um, when he is uh, coming to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And he comes down towards uh, the temple uh, to Jerusalem. And there was a valley between the Mount of Olives and the temple um, and the city, the Valley of Kidron. So Jesus would have gone down to the bottom and then back up the other side um, to enter Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
then we've got uh, on the east side of the city, the Temple Mount. So that's number two. Then to the southeast, we have uh, number three, the lower city, and to the southwest, the upper city. As I said, we will uh, look at all these in more detail. But I'm going to give you a bit of a different picture of Jerusalem now, um, an artist impression um, looking from the south uh, up north, up towards the north. So again, you can see the Mount of Olives rising on the eastern side of the city. And actually, the, the town of Bethany would have been just over the ridge of the hill on the other side. Um, so when Jesus came on the donkey, he would have come um, partly up the other side and then down the Mount of Olives. Um, and you can see the temple there. Um, and again, the upper and the lower city. Um, the upper city on the western side of the city, um, again, upper was literal. Um, this part of the city was built on higher ground and it was the home to the rich and the powerful. Um, in ancient cities, the rich lived higher up for the very simple reason that the air was fresher and cooler up there uh, and waste and rainwater would run down away from the city. Uh, also, the upper city being on the, uh, the western side of the city, um, in the evening, the breeze would come um, from um, the west. So they would get the cooling breezes there as well. Um, in the upper city, um, there are various points of interest, which we'll come back to. Um, but just to mention uh, one thing um, is that the tomb of David was there. Peter, on, in his sermon on uh, the day of Pentecost, talks ab about the fact that David died and was buried. And then he says his tomb is here to this day. So that, that would have been in the upper city. Um, as I said, there are other significant buildings that we will come back to. Then to the south, um, central to the south and the east was the lower city. So this was the home of the ordinary people where conditions would be far, far more ca uh, cramped and squalid, where people would have lived in much, much smaller, smaller uh, houses off very narrow alleyways. So what would Jesus have seen as he was coming down the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday? He would have seen one thing more than any other, the temple. Uh, the temple dominated the city in every way. It covered about an eighth or about 12% of the actual area of the city. So it was huge. It also dominated it, obviously, religiously. Here was the centre, the very heart of the Jewish faith. But it also dominated it economically. Jerusalem, um, being in the centre of, uh, of Israel, actually had no port. It had no river running through it. It had little agriculture. Uh, because if you see, I think, as shown well from this uh, um, this, 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 this model or this artist's impression, it's dry and arid land around, so very little uh, agriculture nearby. Um, sure, like any city, it had shops and it had traders, um, but the temple was the uh, actual economic powerhouse, if you like, because three times a year, pilgrims would flood to Jerusalem and to the temple in their three, um, the three Jewish festivals um, of Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. Um, it's reckoned that probably around this time, uh, Jesus' time, the population of Jerusalem would have been maybe 45 to 50,000 people. But at the time of the festivals, it's possible that that was quadrupled and that the population would go up to around 200,000. And of course, as people flocked to Jerusalem, they would bring with it their money uh, and their wealth. And much of that would go to the city's main employer, the temple. <laughs> 
Um, the oldest part of the temple was um, built by um, those returning from exile. It's referred to in, in books like um, Ezra and some of the prophets. It was then expanded under a bunch of people called the Hasmoneans, who were the ruling dynasty before uh, Herod. Uh, and that's Herod the Great, um, the Herod that was around at the time when Jesus was born. Um, and under Herod the Great, uh, the temple, and in fact, Jerusalem was expanded hugely. Um, Herod was a prolific builder, not only in Jerusalem, but in other parts um, of, um, of the land as well. And in fact, if you remember in John chapter two, when Jesus says, destroy this, speaking of his own body, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, the Jews reply to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Now that's not building it from scratch, but that was all the expansion work that Herod was doing and actually making the temple far, far grander than it had been before. And maybe this, uh, this next model um, gives you something of a feel for its size and its grandeur. Um, but we'll be coming back, we'll be uh, visiting, if you like, the different areas of the temple as we go on through this. But uh, as Jesus came down the Mount of Olives, he would probably also have seen these tents pitched uh, around the city of Jerusalem. Um, because when Jesus came at the, at the uh, festival of Passover, this was the greatest festival. Um, and some pilgrims would have been staying with friends or family inside the city. Others would have been camping outside Jerusalem because the, uh, the rule was, certainly at this time, that the Passover could only be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Jesus, Jesus as we know from the Gospel accounts, was at least for uh, a good part of the week staying in Bethany, so just over the Mount of Olives. Um, and it was probably, probably with his good friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who we know had given him hospitality in their house before. Uh, and it probably would have taken, you know, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes every day to walk into Jerusalem from Bethany. Now we're going to take another look at the temple. Um, this just is pointing out various gates to the temple because Jesus could have entered um, the temple in quite a number of different places. So on the east side with the blue, uh, light blue arrow, we've got what was called uh, the Sousa gate. Um, then we've got on the south side with the, um, or your left, we have um, two more uh, massive gates. Uh, that's the green, light green and the yellow arrows. And together they were called uh, the Hulder gates. Um, one of the gates was uh, known as the triple gate and the other was the double gate, simply because of the number of archways that, that led in. Then there was um, another entrance on the uh, southwest side, that's the dark blue arrow. And that would have been uh, a way into the temple, up some stairs and um, across a bridge because there was a valley, another valley that ran straight through the middle of Jerusalem um, on the um, western side, so the far side of the temple and right down to the bottom of the city of Jerusalem. Um, then on the western side with the red arrow, um, this was a gate that would probably be more mostly used by uh, the rich because as you can see from this picture, there's a pathway um, along a wall that leads from the upper city where the rich and the wealthy tended to live. Then there was one possible final entrance to the north of the temple, the purple arrow. Um, and it's possible that there was an entrance there which was just used for bringing the sacrificial animals into the temple. 
but we're going to go in through the um the yellow arrow so uh over on the south of the temple um and near this entrance their uh, archaeologists have found uh, the remains of what they believe to be um, mikvah, which basically were ceremonial baths. Um, because one thing that Jews understood was that you couldn't just approach a holy God uh, just as you were. And ritual cleansing um, was necessary. Um, as were the sacrifices, which we'll come back to. But some, some of the more rich uh, families would have these um, ritual baths, mikvah, uh, in their own houses. But others, it seems, actually bathed when they got to the temple. Um, oh, Cathy, yes, we've got a question, or are you yawning? No, no, we carry on. Carry on. <laughs> um, so we're going to go up some steps um, to the triple gates. And basically here, we are just about to enter some tunnels which go under part of the temple and then emerge into one of the courtyards beyond. So we're going up some steps and then uh, through these tunnels um, and probably on either side of the tunnels, there were some storehouses for the temple and we're heading, oops, sorry, wrong way, uh, up the steps at the end and just about to go into the open area of the temple courts. Um, but it's just worth pausing for a moment uh, because when we read in either the Gospels or the Book of Acts about um, Jesus or the apostles being in the temple area, it's, it's worth wondering which bit because there were a number of different temple courts, different parts of uh, the temple. And here's a plan um, of the temple. And where you were allowed to go depended on who you were. So um, we are just about to uh, come up where the, uh, the big red arrow is pointing. Um, and we're about to come into the purple area. Uh, and this is the, called the Court of the Gentiles. And actually, this is the only area of the temple where Gentiles could come. Uh, you, so as a Gentile, you were allowed into that area, but that area alone. Um, of course, if you were somebody like a leper, then you weren't actually allowed into the temple complex at all because you were considered unclean. Um, so if you, um, if you were a Gentile, um, a non-Jew, you could only go as far as that yellow line that you can see. And the yellow line was the Soreg. It was a low wall and Gentiles were forbidden to go beyond that point. If you were Jewish, you could go uh, through the Soreg and you could enter the light green area. Uh, and that went um, if you were either a, a, a man or a woman. Um, and in the temple, the sanctuary area itself, there's this area which women were allowed into, which was appropriately enough called the Court of the Women. Um, and then there were some further steps that uh, Jewish men could go up uh, into this narrow strip here where they could watch sacrifices being made. And that was called the Court of Israel. Beyond that, in the green, is the area that was known as the Court of the Priests. Um, and up some more steps again um, was the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could enter, uh, and even then only once a year. And in fact, um, for those of you who've caught up with our daily Bible readings, we were reading Le in Leviticus today about the Day of Atonement. And, and that was the one day of the year when the high priest was allowed to go into this portion of the temple. So we're at the top of the steps and shortly um, we're going to go through these gates but um, we are standing at them uh, and through those gates will be uh, an older part of the temple but where we're standing at the moment in the court of the, Gent uh, court of the Gentiles this was a uh, part of Herod's extensions 
Um, of course, what we don't see in these um, CGI representations is this. This is more what the temple would have looked like, particularly at festival times. It would have been crowded, it would have been bustling, it would have been noisy. Anyway, we've just come up those steps under the tunnel. And if we look back over our shoulder, we would have seen this area behind us, the area that we've just come under, uh, which was this grand area called the Royal Stoa. And there were 160 columns, 40, um, 40 rows of four. And this would have been a very noisy area um, because this was the area where um, the money changers operated and where the sacrificial animals were sold. And uh, this was where Jesus caused a disturbance, turning those uh, tables over. Because the court of the Gentiles was the only place that Gentiles could come to pray to God. And as Jesus said, my house, quoting uh, the Old Testament, my house is a house of prayer for the nations. And Jesus wanted to reestablish that. So we're still standing at the top of the stairs and we're going to look now over to our, not over our shoulders, but over to our right. Because on the east side of the temple, there's another um, colonnaded area, which was known as Solomon's Portico. And in fact, uh, John 10, John chapter 10, tells us that um, Jesus came to Jerusalem in the winter at the time of the, uh, what was known as the Feast of Dedication. And it says in John chapter 10, Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. So uh, that's where Jesus was. And this was um, probably an area where Jesus spent quite a lot of time teaching, uh, particularly it, it, it's out of the sun. You've got uh, shade, the cooler shade. Um, but this was also the place where rabbis would traditionally uh, teach with disciples sitting at their feet. Um, and again and again in the last week of uh, his life, we find Jesus teaching in the temple area. So it's quite possible that a lot of his teaching was being done in this area of the temple. So we're going to go through um, what was known as the Hasmonean Gate um, through to one of the older parts of the temple. And we're going to walk up to that low wall that I spoke of before, the Sorig. And on either side of this, each gap in the Sorig were warning signs written. I think they were written in both Latin and Greek. They were certainly written in Greek. And on them, basically, it said that any Gentile who went through there um, basically did so on pain of death. Um, and there's a story towards the um, uh, end of the book of Acts where Paul is in Jerusalem and the Jews cause a riot because they think, they wrongly think, that Paul has taken a Gentile beyond this point into um, the, uh, the, the next area of the temple. And actually in Ephesians, Paul writes about uh, Jesus being our peace. And he says that Jesus has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And surely it was this low wall that Paul had in mind when he wrote those words, this, divide, this wall that was literally a dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. Um, we're now going to come around the, uh, the east side of the temple. So we're inside the Soreg. Um, and in fact, here's a little um, arrow to show you where we are. So um, we've walked across the temple courts and we've come round to the eastern side of the temple. And we're just about to go through into the court of the women. Um, and there was a superb porch on this side called the Eastern Gate. And note 
once again, we're going up some steps. And with each court, each court in the temple is, was actually higher than the one before. You went up steps at every point and it was a physical symbol of getting ever closer to the highest spiritual pinnacle possible, the place that more than any other represented God's presence on earth. So we're gonna go inside. We're gonna uh, into the court of the women. As soon as we go through the gate, we actually see another gate immediately opposite us um, and rising directly behind it, you have the holy place itself, the sanctuary, which was covered in white marble and gold and facing east, it must have dazzled in the morning sun. But we're going to just, I was staying in the court of the women for a while and we're just going to look to the side of these, uh, these semicircular steps to this area. And basically what we have here is the area that was um, the temple treasury. And we know that Jesus did some of his teaching here. So basically these, these kind of big brass trumpets, people would drop co their coins into, down into these trumpets and they would go down through into these large metal boxes behind where the money was uh, collected and kept. And in Luke 21, it says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And this is where they would have been putting their gifts into these trumpets. Now, here's an interesting little detail. Earlier in John's gospel, in John chapter eight this time, Jesus comes to Jerusalem uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And we're told, well, he makes, he does quite a bit of teaching there, but there's one particular statement that he makes that we're told he made when he was standing in the area. Um, well, John, John says these words, he spoke these words whilst teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Why is John recording that particular little detail that Jesus was standing in this area? Hold that thought a minute because we're going to turn around and have our back to the wall and look back out into the temple area, into the court of the women. Because one thing we see here is four enormous lampstands. Now they don't know exactly what they look like. Different uh, artists' impressions, different models have different uh, ideas. Um, but we do know that they were huge. And um, um, historians like Josephus tell us that at the time of the Festival of Tabernacles, these would be lit. Uh, and apparently some of the young priests would clamber up these, um, these lampstands. These, if you see, uh, have got rungs down the side and they made um, huge wicks for the top of these lamps, made out apparently of um, priests' old tunics, so uh, worn tunics. And they would uh, obviously fill these with, with oil and they would light these wicks. And it's said that these lampstands fill the city or send out their light across Jerusalem. And this, this, was, this happened at the Feast of Tabernacles. And what was this statement? One of these statements that Jesus made when he was standing here in this court at Tabernacles near these lampstands. This is where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So his light was not confined just to Jerusalem. His light would go out into the whole world. So I love that, I love that little detail. Um, but we're going to now go, um, go up into the next courtyard. We're going to pretend, uh, those of us who are women, we're going to pretend we're not women. We're going to pretend that we're men and that we're allowed to go up here. Um, but on these semicircular steps, um, when the daily offerings were made, um, Levites would stand on these steps singing praises to God 
with, uh, with psalms um, as those offerings were made day by day. At the top of the steps, there were some br solid bronze doors called the uh, Nakana Gates. And again, facing e when they were facing east with the morning sun on them, again, they must have dazzled. So we're going to go up those steps and we're going to walk through the gates and we are going to go into um, the court of Israel. If you remember, this was the narrow stri uh, strip in blue in the model of the, t uh, the map of the temple. And this is where the men, Jewish men, could stand watching sacrifices being made. So they could present their offerings to the priest and watch as the priests offered the sacrifices on their behalf. And it's very likely that Jesus would have been here at some point in his life, seeing the sacrifices, the bulls of bloods and goats, which as the book of Hebrews says, and which Jesus knew could never actually take away sin. Um, the blood would be poured out on the, on the, on the altar here. Um, and there was apparently a red line that went out uh, around it and the blood was actually poured against the, temp uh, uh, the altar below that line. Uh, and it said that, that Herod also uh, installed in the temple um, kind of gratings and um, a system that would, that would uh, take the blood away and down into um, the, the Kidron Valley. So a system of, of pipes to take it away. Um, because at times there would have been huge numbers of uh, animals being slaughtered here. To, um, to the left, oops, sorry. To the left, as I said, we have the stone altar. Um, so it wasn't just that blood would be poured out against it, but the offerings would be burnt on the top of it. Um, and here are the next set of steps which you could only go up if you were a priest. And if you went up those steps and you looked to the right, then there would be the inevitable place of slaughter. And at times like the Passover, tens of thousands of beasts would have been killed. And it must have been an absolute assault on the uh, senses with the noise of the animals, the smell of blood, the smell of roasting uh, meat from the altar, the chanting of the Levites um, and the astonishing beauty of the buildings. But if we turn back to you face ahead of us, then we've got the final steps up into the sanctuary itself. Um, and you have these large columns which were coated, covered in pure gold. Uh, and it's said that the wealthy would make donations of solid gold grapes which would be added to these um these vines these golden vines uh, around the pillars uh, but of course the most precious thing was what was inside and through the uh, through the door we can see the, the huge curtain the veil of the temple and if we were a priest then we could go through into what was called the holy place where the priests would offer incense every day. And this would have been where Zechariah, John the Baptist's father was when the angel Gabriel appeared to him. And beyond the incense altar, as I said, you had the veil of the temple, which separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the place that represented God's presence more than anything else. And as we said, only one person, the high priest, could go in there and only once a year and only after sacrifice for his own sin and sacrifice for the sin of the people. And the veil said one thing to you sinful human beings, keep out. The one person who could go in was the high priest. Uh, here we see him dressed in his ceremonial clothes. Um, but actually, just to remind the Jews, who, in their view, was the real boss, the, the Romans actually kept hold of those robes and only let the high priest have them, only handed them over to him 
at festival time. And in fact, right on the north side of the uh, temple was this, the Antonio Fortress. Um, it was a fortress filled with Roman soldiers and its position was no accident because the Romans knew that if there was going to be trouble, then it would most likely be at one of the festivals when Jewish fervor would have been at its height and when the city would have been uh, heaving with Jews and any trouble was likely to start in the temple. However, although the Roman governor um, Pontius Pilate was in charge of Judea, um, Jerusalem wasn't actually where he normally lived. He normally lived um, up the coast at um, a place called Caesarea, um, more of a Roman city. And he actually only kept a kind of token force of around 500 soldiers at the fortress. However, at festival times, Pilate would return to Jerusalem with more soldiers to bolster them. The rest of the time, when he wasn't in Jerusalem, Pilate delegated his power to the high priest. And the high priest had his own private police force of several thousand known as the temple guard. So actually it was the temple guard who arrested Jesus, not, not Roman soldiers. Um, so the temple wasn't just um, a religious and an economic centre, it was also a political and law enforcement centre too. So when Pilate wasn't in town, the high priest actually had incredible power. Uh, and the high priest at this time was Caiaphas. He was part of um, a dynasty of high priests. His father, Annas, sorry, his father-in-law, Annas, was the first of that dynasty and actually was still around um, at this time uh, when Jesus was, uh, was crucified. And Annas was still a massive mover and shaker within Jerusalem, even though the high priest was now his son-in-law, Caiaphas. But Caiaphas was certainly at one of those at the heart of the plot to kill Jesus. We're going to leave the temple for a while um, through the western gate. So the gate on the uh, western side with the uh, yellow arrow in the insert, because we've got a couple more places to visit. So we're going to walk along the wall, the raised walkway to the upper city. If we look to, um, in fact, this is looking back to the temple, but if we were looking uh, the other direction and look to our left, we would have seen the roofs of the houses of the wealthy part of Jerusalem, the upper city. And there are four buildings in this part of the city that are particularly significant to us. Um, somewhere in the upper city, there was a house with a large upper room that was used by Jesus and his disciples for sharing the Passover, the Last Supper. Then somewhere in this area, there is the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. It's here that Jesus was taken when he was arrested. And it's here where they find him guilty at their council meeting and condemn him to death. There is also another um, big um, uh, well, palace uh, known as the Hasmonean Palace, somewhere in this area. And this is where Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great, um, who is the ruler of uh, Galilee, this is where he comes and stays when he is in Jerusalem. And again, that is somewhere that Jesus is sent during its trial. Because if you remember, there was a point at which when Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee, he sent Jesus over to where Herod Antipas was staying um, as Herod was the ruler of Galilee. Now, we don't know where these three buildings were exactly in the upper city, but we know where the fourth building is. Because um, 
when we walk to the western edge of the city, um, this is us standing on the west, right on the western edge of the city, looking back towards the, uh, the temple and the Mount of Olives uh, beyond it, but right in front of us, uh, underneath us, is Herod's palace. And that, that's Herod the Great, not Herod Antipas, but Herod the Great, um, so who built this large, opulent palace. Um, it was another of his great building projects. And it's Pilate's base whenever he's in town. And this is where Jesus will be sent when the Jews want to put him to death. We're going to turn to walk back towards the temple. But as we do, we're going to pause and look over this wall to our left because this is likely where Golgotha was, the place of the skull. Uh, we may sing uh, the hymn, There is a Green Hill, um, but if it was a hill, it probably wasn't actually very green because this was a rocky, arid area. You know, we may have in our mind's eye this sort of idea of a kind of hill with the crosses on top of it, um, Calvary, the place of the skull. But actually, this artist's impression is far more likely. The Romans had a nasty habit of crucifying people, not far away and out of sight, but in very public places near uh, roads. Here's one of the routes leading out of Jerusalem and probably Golgotha was here. Um, the reason that the Romans crucified their victims so publicly was that it said to others in no uncertain terms, this is what happens to people who defy Roman rule. And in fact, Matthew and Mark both record that, um, that those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus on the cross. So again, in a very public place uh, near a thoroughfare where people uh, walked by. But uh, something else to notice is gardens and tombs in this area. Um, it may, in fact, here's the map again. Um, so although there may not have been a green hill, um, this would have been outside the city wall. And I'm going to fast forward 2000 years to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem today. I don't know whether anybody's had a chance to go to Jerusalem and to visit it. Um, and it's a shrine it, within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They've got one shrine, which is supposedly where uh, the crucifixion happened and another shrine which supposedly was where uh, Jesus's tomb was and I have to say I was I was initially skeptical when I visited uh, quite a number of years ago um, this site as to you know having the two shrines within one church um, until I read again the bit in the gospels where it spoke of um, the place where Jesus was crucified and it said in that place there was a garden so Jesus body wasn't taken any distance it was put in a tomb that was very very close by and on the tour that I went on we had a, a New Testament scholar called Peter Walker with us uh, and I remember saying to him you know is this likely to be the actual place and he nodded. He said that there was a, a, a very early tr a tradition, um, early enough to be before the details had been forgotten, um, that placed the site of the crucifixion and the tomb, uh, certainly in this area, if not at these exact spots. Um, and certainly for me, although I I just hated all the bling and the gold, which seemed a complete antithesis of the crucifixion and, and the tomb. Nevertheless, 
it still felt as if I was standing on holy ground. Um, and fairly early on in church history, some of the hill was carved away and the whole site incorporated uh, into this church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I, I, know, it's, it's, I know it's something that there is still a uh, debate about, uh, and it all hinges on where the actual city wall was in Jesus' day. Um, but some of the stuff I've, I've read, um, in fact, reread just today um, from archaeologists um, does suggest that, again, that, that this, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, is the site of Golgotha um, and the tomb. But there's one last place in Jerusalem we're going to revisit because at the moment that Jesus died, outside the city walls, um, something else happened across the city. So we have a very real death of the Son of God at 3 p.m. Uh, and maybe on April the 3rd, AD 33, on a rocky outcrop just outside the city so that we might be forgiven. And back in the temple at that exact moment, God himself did something to show the eternal universal significance of what had just happened. If you remember in the gospel stories, it simply said the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Top to bottom because it was God who did it. And it was an act that said, instead of keep out, as the curtain had said before, it was an act that's now said, come in. The way into the holy place, the way into God's presence has been opened through the blood of Jesus. So these real events on a real day in a real place have a real significance for us, not just for today, but for eternity. Um, and the final words are going to go to Peter and John, who were, well, eyewitnesses, people who witnessed the events with their own eyes. And Peter writes, we did not follow cleverly invented <laughs> stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John writes, Jesus did many other miraculous signs, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there we go. That's our whistle-stop tour of first century Jerusalem. And um, does anybody have any questions? I hope you enjoyed that anyway. I mean, I, I love that kind of thing of just seeing yeah. the history uh, and just underlining the kind of the historical nature of what, of what we believe. And I think sometimes seeing some of those actual details just hammers that point home. That this, you know, these are real places, real times, real people would have been witnessed by, yeah, particular people on a particular day in history at a particular place. Uh, Corinne, the, um, the temple was dismantled wasn't it, by the Romans sometime later. Um, I think dismantled would be a, 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 a polite <laughs> word for it. They smashed it to pieces, basically. How much um, survives today of what we've seen? There is, I, I think, basically, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is today. If you saw mm. a a picture of Monday Jerusalem, you would still see the kind of the wall of the outside of the Temple Mount mm. um, and that uh, with this this mosque on top on the place of what on the site of what was the most holy place for the Jews. So you can imagine how Jews feel about that. But you see them um, at the Western Wall okay. of so on the That's other the side wall. of the, uh, the Wailing Wall. Yes, mm. on the other side of the, the Temple. Uh, which is kind of what survives, um, yeah, to this day still. And in fact, if you if you um, are able to go to Jerusalem, um, certainly, do you remember that bit on the the south side of the temple where when we went up to the um, where we were going to go up into the temple? Yes, um, yeah. That, if you go there today, you can walk along the area because mm. it's been unearthed. 
Mm. I mean, a big problem in Jerusalem is that as well as being a historical city, it's a big modern city mm. um, with huge religious tensions within it. So actually, archaeology in the city, archaeological digs, much as archaeologists and historians would like to do them, what they can actually do in practice is very limited. And politicised. And politi politicised, mm. yes. But they do continue to make discoveries. Mm. Um, uh, I can't remember how long ago it was they kind of came across the Pool of Siloam. Okay. Yeah, so they, um, they found that. I just, I just love this. I mean, there's, there's far more historical detail as well. I mean, that was a, you know, there, there are other things that, that, that could be said. I mean, for example, that they think they may have found the house of, that belonged to um, Caiaphas's father-in-law, that the high priest Annas, um, and it's a very large house and quite opulent um, because he was rich. Um, and it's reckoned there was quite a lot of um, corruption in, in the mm. temple and what went on in, the, in, in that day. So basically, you know, if you were bringing an animal for sacrifice, you could either bring your own animal, but then you had to pay a priest to actually give it the thumbs up and say it was a, it was a suitable animal to be sacrificed or you could buy one from the temple but at an inflated price so if you were kind of bringing animals for sacrifice it was lose lose you were going to have to pay you know above and beyond what you should have should have done which again you know when when Caiaphas speaks in John's gospel about one man dying for the people. He he's talking about, you know, we might, you know, if we don't do something, there may be a riot. The, the Romans are going to come out and take our temple away. You know, it's not just a religious statement, but it's a political and economic statement as well. So, yeah, uh, plenty of other um, archaeological details associated with um, uh, Jerusalem. And um, uh, I don't know if I can get this um, easily, get this up again. Let's see if I, I can. There we go. Um, because there was also, um, I think I mentioned it, this valley that ran down through um, uh, Jerusalem. And um, on the, during the Feast of Tabernacles, the high priest would go from the Temple Mount and, and he would go down through the city of Jerusalem, all the way down to the pool of Siloam, um, where he would draw a golden jug full of water. The whole procession would go back up to the city. Um, and on the last and the greatest day of the feast, he would pour out this water uh, on the altar. And on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stands up and cries out in a loud voice, um, saying, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Uh, possibly at the moment, the mm. high priest is pouring out this big jug of water. Um, so, yeah, there, there were other things of um, significance uh, in the, um, the layout of Jerusalem. Uh, yeah, so this is where they found the uh, Pool of Siloam. Mm. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Well, thank you for listening um, so well. Um, so I hope, you you. That. And I hope, it, hope it kind of also, you know, gets us all thinking towards, towards Easter um, and towards the events that we're looking at um, this week. Interesting. I don't know whether this sort of thing interests you, but I mentioned a, a couple of the time about the date of Good Friday. And that's quite an interesting thing because Jesus gives, uh, or rather Luke's gospel in particular, gives some datings um, of when Jesus' ministry starts, which narrows it down to a quite um, specific, more or less specific time within kind of uh, an 18th month period or a year period where Jesus started his ministry. Um,
but the Gospels don't tell us specifically how long Jesus' ministry uh, lasted for. Um, but when you look at John's Gospel in particular, he talks about Jesus going to the temple on a number of occasions. And it's really from John's Gospel that we get the idea that Jesus had a public ministry of about three and a half years. And the thing that is used to, to date the, um, the, the, the possible dates of the crucifixion is we know roughly when, um, it, when it would have been within sort of probably two or three years. Um, and the question was, when, when did the full moon fall on a Thursday? And there are two possible dates, kind of two most likely dates, one in AD 30 and one in AD 33. But there are various reasons for thinking that the AD 33 one is possibly the, the, the better date to go for. Um, from just from what was happening politically at that time. Um, because we see in, um, in the Gospels, Pilate trying to placate the Jews, basically. And we know that early on in Pilate's ministry, uh, not ministry, Pilate's rule, um, he wasn't like that at all. But then something particular happened in, I think it was AD 32, which was the guy who had actually got Pilate the job um, fell out of favour with Caesar, big time. In fact, Caesar slaughtered him and his family. So the person who had been Pilate's main supporter suddenly was out completely out of favor so Pilate was on very kind of thin ice and so would have been in a position where he would have wanted not wanted any um political upheaval and so that instead of not caring what the Jews thought was actually wanting to placate them uh hence giving in to their desire to have see Jesus crucified mm. so without that Jesus wouldn't have been crucified Without that injustice. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, God, yeah. got, it, got it, had it all planned. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>